All right, so pretty <laughs> simple. Real quick? You want to call it? Yeah. Oh, I think she's in uh, Paletti's room, though. Oh, she is. Okay. Yeah. Tori, you in? Um, Do you know. want me to wait a few minutes? I don't mind waiting. I think I'm still, yeah, I'm still there. <clears throat> so you guys have been busy, huh? Extremely. I'm ready, sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be multitasking, so sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Okay. So, Paul, you just could get more people involved if I tell them to bring them lunch. Food. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it is what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, this company is really strict about that. No, I know. I worked when I worked at the Mayo Clinic. When I first started, they were all about the food, you know, trips, and yeah. And then eventually, they said, "No more, no more, <clears throat> none." That's right. right. Nothing. Yeah, it's all about uh, safe harbors. Or so, you know, what do they do with all that money? Now? <laughs> give it to the higher ups or what? That's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Owners, right? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> it's actually, it's all going to the lawyers yeah. to look at the contracts. It's actually funny, they won't even pay for lunch for us to go out and educate now. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, yes. it, uh, so my name is Paul Wentworth. I'm a clinical educator for Teleflex, which is actually an independent contractor position. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually work for Teleflex. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. The sales team does. But he's when they're busy or they have a special group that they want, you know, a clinical person to go out and do, they hire me to come out and they pay me. So I don't work for Teleflex. I actually have no skin in the game. Use it, don't use it, changes nothing with my life. But if you're gonna use it, I want you to use it correctly and not yeah. have a problem and use it again in the future. So that's the whole basis for my presentation. Uh, my background is I'm a paramedic. I've been practicing here in Connecticut for about 33 years now. So I use this really on a regular basis. I use it all the time. You're still a medic? I am. I am. I still... Uh, what, do you, what do you work for? Middlesex. Okay. I'm, uh, it's a good medic. That's a good uh, paramedic program. It is. It is. Hard to get into. Yeah. It used to be hard to get into. Now it's a little easier. But hmm. I guess everybody thinks that. Um, but yeah, I've been working at quite a while. Um, so basically the easy IO, um, IO, tons of research on it, lots of uh, papers that are published to show that it's safe. Uh, most people think it's a relatively new technology. It predates 1900. Initially introduced to Petey's uh, in 85, and then adults in about 2015 crossed over into the interosseous world in civilian medicine. When it crossed to adults, the problem became penetrating the bone, and easy IO was created. Basically, the, the uh, driver causes the needle set to penetrate the bone at an RPM of about 350 times per minute, allowing that needle set to make a hole in the bone the exact same size as the needle. What does that mean for you guys? You can put it under a, let it, a lot of pressure. If you get comfortable and you start using the proximal humerus, that also means you can do CTAs, you can do auto infusers, whether that be a level one or a Belmont, whatever you guys use here. Um, if you use either of them through a proximally humeral placed IO. That was gonna be my question to you is, can you do CT scans with IV contrast? Yes, through absolutely. IO? You'll notice that uh, the IVP dye is uh, listed, the contrast dye is listed as a safe medication through the interosseous route. What you'll get is an argument from your radiologist that it has to be an 18 AC or higher. And my advice to everybody is each kit comes with a pink bracelet. The pink bracelet has a 1-800 number on it, answered 24 seven by a physician medical director. And I've seen it work a number of times where they were trying to do a CTA and they called this number put the radiologist on with them, and they found the solution to do it. Now, what I will bring you, what also is in the kit, is an extension design for this. It's got the low profile, but that low profile builds pressure. So if you're gonna use it with a CTA, with an auto injector, or the level one, you have to remove this piece. 
because this is not pressure rated, so it'll never support pressure above 300 millimeters of mercury. Mm. So go directly to the hub, or use your pressure pressure gotcha. rated no extension that's there. Right. But the, this is the piece you remove. Gotcha. From the power injector directly to the you got it. So you're saying go directly to the hub. Exactly. So if you unscrew that, it's a universal lure lock. Nothing different than anything right else. Got it. Exactly. Now just remember, it won't work in a tibia. It'll only work in the proximal ah, so humeral. That was going to be my second. So point. it has to be a proximal humeral placement. Just so because of the just because of the flow restriction the in the tibia. Think about how narrow, how small yeah. the marrow channel is in the tibia, how much pressure you have to put on it to even get it to run. All you're going to achieve is about one liter an hour. In the proximal humerus, we know you're three seconds from the heart. So when you push something there immediately into the axillary, subclavian, superior vena cava, and right atrium. So three seconds. In addition, fluid resuscitation, you can easily hit uh, three to four liters per hour just hanging your line to gravity. The pressure bag that comes with these pumps up to 300 millimeters of mercury, which will achieve anywhere from six, seven, even some studies show eight. And then when you eliminate the extension, you can go on the other That's devices. Um, now, I'm not that familiar with a Belmont. I've never played with one. But level one, you can go full speed. A Belmont, you cannot turn up all the way. So I guess... What's a Belmont? It's another... It's the competitor to a own. level one. Nice. Yeah, they're very popular in Boston. I've seen them for you. Yeah, I guess they're, they're pretty simple devices and easier to use. So, um, you're going to have three needles to choose from. Pink used to be traditionally called the PD needle. The FDA approves all these needles based on weight range and tissue depth, but we want you to forget about weight and just worry about tissue depth, which means the pink needle is really obsolete now. It's only 15 millimeters in length. Older kids are so big. Exactly. And I mean, kids are yeah. big, but even a newborn is a is a little Michelin baby. They got a lot of yeah. tissue there, sure. and the localized <laughs> swelling will create pressure on that hub, and the pressure will cause it to migrate. In as little as 35 to 45 cc's of no, fluid, there. or one to two cc's of a caustic Sorry. drug, can lead to the risk of a compartment syndrome forming in the tibia. Um, all three are surgical stainless steel, so none can go in an MRI, but they are safe in a CAT scan. They're all 15 gauge needles, so they are uh, all considered large bore access. Colors have no correlation to IVs. Not that you guys would pick an IV based on color, but when you go to teach a bunch of IV therapists, they get hung up on the fact that the colors don't match. The, Blue one is 25 millimeters in length. That's going to be a uh, tibial placement from newborn to 900 years old. Doesn't much matter. If you're going in the tibia for some reason, it 90% of the time will be the blue needle. The yellow needle is 45 degrees. Uh, sorry, 45 uh, millimeters. So that needle is the proximal humerus in your adult population 100% of the time. Take any question. You can have a 90-year-old little cachectic little old lady. It will be the yellow needle, period, end of story. That needle um, can also be well, used. Even if you're palpating, I mean, I feel like my proximal humerus is pretty, it's pretty palpable. Right. You're still going... You're going, going right into that end. Exactly right. And do you hub this yeah. whole thing when you put it in? You sure do. Really? You sure do. Over 40, over 39 kilograms, <laughs> you hub it until it goes in. Under 39 kilograms, you can try your very best to stop, but typically you're going to slide right through. I mean, it is such a soft, pliable bone. It, it, it goes in very, very easily. Will it go through the joint space? Will it, go through it, through it will not. Head? And the key yeah. here is the angle that you're going to place it. Okay. And there, it really, I had mentioned there's a weight range and a tissue depth. Each needle has a tissue depth indicator on it. And it's the black line that's painted on each needle. The black line closest to the hub is five millimeters from the hub. The bony cortex is three millimeters in thickness. So what we know is when you load this on, cleanse your sight, push through until you hit bone. If you can't clearly see a black line, 
this needle will be too short. It might gain access to the marrow space, but ultimately it's going to compress tissue in doing so, and that tissue will want to return to its normal position, leading to it migrating out. So you need to move up a length. Yellow needle, straight in, hit bone. Once you're up against the bone, tons of needle. So the rule of thumb with an easy I.O. is there is no such thing as a needle too long, only a needle too short. Like you were saying, in the proximal humerus, I'm just going to go all the way in until this up. You hit the quarter. Vortex. You got it. I, I'm not going to worry about feeling for depth. It's just poop right in, and it will be over like that. But in the tibia, you do have to worry about it because let's remember that bony cortex is three millimeters in thickness and there's a lot more than three millimeters. Right, you're gonna go to the back side of the bone. You got it, exactly. So you have to feel that tactile feedback. So basically all you're gonna do is one complete squeeze of the trigger, never let it up, and allow the driver to do the work. So you're not gonna put a lot of pressure on it. And you spin it and feel for the release. And there it goes. It's not a real bone. In a real bone, you're going to feel a big difference. Right. And you're going to go for a while in the tibia because it's weight there. You have needle exposed there, which is just fine. Because ultimately, when you take this out, the dressing that you're going to use is made to accommodate up to 10 millimeters of exposed needle. Mm -hmm. And this just slides right over the top. Nothing holds it on, nothing else. The secret of hitting, hitting the flow rates is a good flush. You flush it nice and solid, and then hook up your IV and use it. No, we can flush, but you can't aspirate. For oh, it. you can aspirate. You can? Absolutely. So okay. here's... You want to aspirate first. I create the pathway and then push so, it over. Some people aspirate all the time because that is traditional teaching. <clears throat> Other people, you guys are in a hospital, let's say you're ruling somebody out for sepsis or something like that, and you want to draw some blood. You can aspirate and draw blood off of it, and then you can run that blood. The only thing that can't be correlated to marrow blood is a complete blood cell counter, or CBC. Right. Right. Does that mean? So everything else can either be directly or indirectly correlated, including an H&H, &H, which is home run for you guys. But when you think, of, I'll go back to sepsis, a lactate off an IO is actually more accurate than a lactate off of an IV. Yale actually did a pretty big study that looked at that and said the only way, or it's more accurate or close, more closely uh, related to a central line draw than an IV draw. So that being said, the vast majority of labs can't run IO blood because they don't get enough samples to QC their machine to run the blood. So, before you bother drawing blood. Personally, in my practice, I never draw back. Because ultimately, if you don't get anything back, you're still gonna flush it and feel for a good flush and feel and make sure it's not extravagated. So, to me, the, the drawing back is just an extra step that wastes time. Good. Matt, that's your question. Early yeah. on when we started, we put an IO in someone's tibia. Yeah, I remember. And it was like early on. I've done it before, and I didn't have much of a problem with it. But when we did it this one time, I mean, we could not flush this thing. Flush sure. We tried and tried. And the patient was screaming. Um, and I know that you yeah. do lidocaine through it, but either way, we could not. We tried. Yeah. All of it. We were pushing it. it would not yeah. Get through. So you could have been in the posterior wall. Okay. You could have been partially through the bone. But to be quite honest, I would have met would think that if they had that kind of pain with you trying to push it, it was in there, and depending on the history, could have been a fracture, could have been a, a, metas a metastasized piece of bone, something like that would have created the pain. Mm -hmm. um, because the flush, it truly is, the placement people tend not to notice. Um, they can be sitting up, talking to you, having a conversation, and it will be in before they realize it. The flush is definitely creating a lot of pain, and that's based on the change in pressure right. within that marrow space, specifically right. within the Bulkman channel. Yeah. So lidocaine does work great for that, but you have to have the time. Right. So the lidocaine is a simple solution. It's 2% preservative-free and epi-free. I bring the code part box of lidocaine 
because number one, it's readily available everywhere, and number two, it's the dose you're looking for. And I know you guys have lidocaine everywhere, I'm sure, 1% to choose from and everything else. The 2% is 20 milligrams per milliliter. And basically, once this is placed, you wanna go directly to the hub with the lidocaine and give two mLs. But you give the two mLs over two minutes. Ah, uh, slow push. Very slow. Because ultimately, if you push it any faster, it's gonna cross out of the vasculature. And you have to get it stuck in those Volkman channels. If it gets past those, it's just gonna vasculate. So it has to sit there and block off the fast sodium channels. Right. So two minutes, two mLs, a constant push, not one mL in the first 15 seconds and one mL in the last 15 seconds. It's just a slow push. Can this cap come off? Yeah, it's an empty vial. It's, uh, it won't come out. So you just screw it to the base of this to so take out that. That's what you'll, it's similar to epinephrine in a code situation. It's so right in every code. Puncture. Yeah, that just, and you can't, it's, again, I use it all the time. And then you push your two on those. You got it. Like the two, this guy here. Yep. Yeah. Well, it'll be to the extension, right? Or do you push No, you go directly, directly to the hub. Directly, directly to the hub. <clears throat> you put a set, your saline flush in and you let it sit for a minute. Okay. Because you have to allow it to actually sit in there. Typically, I tell the joke at this point, if you're at the dentist and they ever put Novocaine in your gums and they immediately went to drilling, you'd never tolerate that. You can't get up and walk away, so you have to stand there and watch it marinate. Come on, that's humorous. Mm -hmm. Two oh, dad okay. jokes back and back. <laughs> so, you let it sit for a minute, flush it, and then you flush the fibrin out of those Volkman channels, which means you've exposed more sensory nerve endings. So they recommend one more ml, or 20 more milligrams, over one minute. So it will take you a total of four minutes to complete this process. So if your patient isn't gonna survive four minutes, they have to feel the pain. And let's face it, the vast majority of people who aren't gonna survive four minutes, the treatment you're trying to get this vascular access for is airway. So push something that's gonna immediately uh, induce that. So intomidate, quick flush, ketamine, quick flush. They'll go out and be unconscious and then continue on your way. But consider the lidocaine later. So with, back to the question with us, that one time that didn't work, should we have just pushed harder? No, I, at some point you can't push any, you know. I imagine you guys were pushing pretty hard. In the tibia, you have to put a lot of pressure to flush. <clears throat> flush. More so than the... More so than, oh yeah, the shoulder will be closer. It's a big chamber inside of the exactly. humeral head, right? Lot, that's exactly right. Tons of space, tons of room, and it cleans out very quickly. Now, uh, what's the recommended length of time that you can keep an IO? Is very it good hours? It's So over the age of 12 is 48 hours. Okay. So you have two days. Mm -hmm. Under the age of 12 is 24 hours. Ah, so it's different for each. So a couple things, if you get somebody from Europe coming through or somebody from other countries, or somebody with the military. They have a 72 hour dwell period in those, in other areas, so no 72 hours. And the other thing, they're big on sternum in the military, and it makes sense. You actually can get like 13 liters an hour through the sternum. Yeah, we will not be doing no sternum. Yeah, this device cannot go in the sternum. You need a guide to prevent you from going through the maneuverium. Yeah. And if you don't have a guide and this one doesn't have it, you can't use it. Yeah, I'm not into uh, biopsy parts here. You got it. <laughs> You'll be infusing directly into the right atrium. Yeah. That's all right. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and that's red? Yeah. Is red is for sternum or what? So no, the red is actually a training needle. Red is non-sterile. Okay. It should be solid pink, solid blue, or solid yellow. Okay. So we give it a try? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to just go through the proximal oh, humerus yeah. because what I really want you to worry about is the proximal humerus and get comfortable placing that. Um, I'm just going to hit, before we move on to that, is the five contraindications. There are five contraindications to using this. None of them have to do with systemic disease. It's purely site selection. So to me, the first three go into one bucket. The bone has to be intact. So no fracture of the target bone, no previous orthopedic surgeries that would lead you to indicate that, to feel that there might be a prosthetic in there or an amputation. 
I do. Don't put it in an amputated extremity. And then the third one is no previous I.O. in 48 hours. So 48 hours after it's taken, you can use that bone again. But in that 48, you cannot. The fourth one's pretty simple. Don't go through cellulitis. Don't go through a topical infection. The fifth one has everything to do with the landmark. So if your patient's so morbidly obese or edematous, you can't feel the sites of the tibia, you gotta go somewhere else. If they're a small child, you wanna go to the proximal humerus, but the two bones of the proximal humerus haven't fused together to create a greater tubercle, you can't use it. So those are the five contraindications, that's it. Osteogenesis imperfecta, osteoporosis, burns, all of those are good to go. Even a past mastectomy with lymphedema, you can go in that extremity. It is not a contraindication. Those are the simple five contraindications. And that's it. Um, so now, finding the landmark. I would mentioned you want to be on the greater tubercle. What you want to do is start by putting your patient's arm in a position that will make that greater tubercle stand up. By putting their hand on their belly button, internally rotating it and putting it up against them, and I don't know if you guys have access to this, but if you have a Lucas auto compression device, arms up in the Lucas, perfect position. So you can use it while they're in the Lucas. If you don't have that, then it's really irrelevant to you. But once you do that, if you think about taking the palm of your hand and pushing on their shoulder, you will easily feel the ball of that greater tubercle. Now what I like to teach is just take that hand, put it there, and now slide two fingers down like you're pulling a seatbelt. When your two fingers are on that ball, that is your target. Just that simple. But the beautiful thing about this is that if you put the needle anywhere in here, it's going to run great as long as you remember it has to go in at a 45 degree angle. So when I place this, I'm going to want to take this and go forty-five degrees going on along the anterior posterior plane going posteriorly, forty-five degrees going inferiorly, or I use the seat belt, I'm gonna to go to where the seat belt's gonna hook into the car. That's the angle I'm gonna look at. If that doesn't work for you, pretend the needle's three feet long. As it comes through, once you get it all the way in, it's gonna come out their opposite butt cheek or into their wallet, whatever's in the way. If that doesn't, you guys are surgeons, and I know there are a lot of jokes about surgeons and EKGs, but <laughs> follow AVR or lead to. Whichever thing works for you, that's the key there, is always a 45 degree angle. And if you think about it, in a resuscitation, you might have somebody at the head, respiratory next to them, somebody on each side. One of those two 45 degree angles is always open. If there's somebody standing in that 45, they are doing one thing. They're the individual who piss you off on the highway because they stop and look at an accident on the opposite high. They are purely gawking. So you found the site. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bug each of you to find it on me and then practice the angle on the mannequin because ultimately the mannequin does not have a good anatomical form. Who wants to go first? So find that location on me. Here. Yeah, that's exactly right. Just that simple. Here. There. There. Yeah, there. you got it. So go ahead, somebody. So you, you did it like this, you can also Internally, exactly. Internally, okay. Whichever one you want. That's exactly right. I'm just going to point out after you've done one or two of them, you won't do any, you'll just feel it and it's there. The vast majority of people, it is obvious. We'll do this in a second. The person that you're going to, most people would think somebody who's obese you're going to have a problem with, but as soon as you lay them back, their fat falls down and you can feel those proximal humerus. The people who are tough are bar bodybuilders. Somebody with so much built up muscle, you just can't figure out the difference between the two. What's what? And that's it.
Boom. That's it. <clears throat> so you can feel it. So if I do it on this side, it'd go like this. You do could. you want to go right? What you really want to practice, to me, what you guys want to practice is what's going to be most comfortable. You might be right next to them and do that position. Most people are at the head, so they're going to come from behind and slide their hand up. And you can do the same thing. So there are slight seconds of difference between right and left. Right's faster. You got it. Exactly. It's pre-portal, so you're avoiding all of that. But, I mean, it's now, so, so it really comes down to go to what's the most convenient. Okay. And I'll typically look, in the hospital, I will typically put it in the left, because respiratory is always to the right of the physician, so that place is occupied. Makes sense. And then to remove it, you just literally just pull it out like that? So what we actually recommend for removal is to take a lure lock syringe and put it on, uh, because in a patient, it will not come out easily. And just turn quarter clockwise and then pull straight off and pull it straight out. Gotcha. I'm trying to I think they are. So you just it. push straight in. Yep. You're up against the bone and now just pull the trigger. And you're done. Yeah. Now, are you general surgery or orthopedic surgery? Or we do. General. We do it trauma. all. We also do trauma. Yeah. So, like, that's where we're probably most likely going to be. Yeah. Doing. That's why, because you know, I just wanted to have more information on the IOs because we have tried them before. Yeah. The one time didn't work for us, but even then we were not like overly, you know, experts with it. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we, if we're going to start using them, to know what the Absolutely. hell we're doing. So, for oh, yeah. in your world, if you look at that list of meds, all blood products can go through an IO. So, there's no restriction on FFPs or anything else. Um, there are really only two meds you can't get through an IO, which are chemotherapy agents and TPN, or parenteral nutrition. Two that should not go through anything that you're using. <laughs> Dude, I just pushed it and went in. You found an old <laughs> That's how good. Old holes. I was like, oh man, what just happened there? <laughs> we need to Craig supply. doesn't need no easy I.O. I don't need I.O. Just give me a needle. <laughs> don't fucking get it in. <laughs> you want 22 gauge? Do I want a 22 gauge? There we go. Did I put that at the right angle? You sure did. That's beautiful. That will run great. So the 45 yeah. is kind of an approximation. If you're 50, if you're 60, yeah. if you're 35, it's going to be great. What you want to avoid is 90. If you go 90 straight to medial, yeah, right. you you're going to go into the growth plate, it's yeah. not going to flow. If you go 90 straight anterior posterior, it's going to go into the posterior wall of the bone, probably, and not flow. But 45, it's going to flow great. great. So you said to take it out, um, you said uh, you could put a, a lure lock oh, syringe to take this off. Yeah. And then you know how you put it here? You put a lower lock and just pull, turn it, and then pull. Yeah, just remember turn clockwise. Clock because oh, clockwise, clockwise continues to tighten the lower lock. Uh -huh. Makes no difference with the needle because, as you can feel, the needle doesn't have threads. So there's no way to unscrew it. You can unscrew it all you want, it's not, <coughs> not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I think we'd use like a back of a. The back of a. Or something. That's a yeah, out, it's actually just with a lure lock syringe. It's a piece of cake. Yeah. Okay. It becomes well. It's never a piece of cake. IOs. I'd said at the bit. It makes a hole the exact same size as the needle, which means it's not going to be easy <coughs> taking it out. Okay. Um, so humerus, proximal tibia. And I'm gonna put my right. foot on your. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the tibial side, find the tibial tuberosity and come medial two centimeters on your adult. And that's where it is. 
You don't want to be any further down because the further down you go, the bone thins down and it's in the marrow space thins out. So you'll get very poor uh, <coughs> flow. So directly medial two centimeters from the tibial. You got it. Exactly right. If you can't feel the tib tibial tuberosity, let's say in a baby, or let's say in an individual who's never been weight bearing, just find the base of the patella, two centimeters below it, two centimeters medial in the adult. One in one in a pediatric. But you place it right there. The other thing that I'm gonna tell you is FDA approved not too long ago the distal femur for mm -hmm. peds. Mm -hmm. The distal femur, some great things about it. Since they introduced the distal femur, there has not been a compartment syndrome in it. So very safe on that. It's a known complication of compartment syndrome in the tibia, but not the femur. As well. the, it can yeah. happen. Proximal humerus, there hasn't been either. So if you think about it, the compartments are much bigger, which gives you a lot more error, room for error in finding that it's extravagated before something bad happens. In addition, the tibia where we all started has about a 78% first pass success rate. So almost a quarter of the time you miss the tibia. The distal femur has a 98% first pass success rate. So it's almost impossible to miss. The limitation is it's only FDA approved for pediatrics. But pediatrics use the American Academy of Pediatricians uh, guideline for the definition of a pediatric which is anybody under the age of 21. So if for some reason they have two broken arms, something like that, distal femur is still an option in people under 21. Proximal humus fractures. Yeah. So I mean, you can think Yeah, you're good to go. It's purely target bone. Target bone. To oh. be uh, quite honest. Femur, fra femur fracture, you could still go into. You could still go into. Just the bone of interest cannot be fractured. That is exactly right. Orthopedic yeah. Yeah, implant. It is, yeah. It's, I would not do that. If you have an open book pelvic fracture, I don't think I'd go in the tibia below it because it's just, where's that fluid? It's not going to go anywhere. But the proximal humerus, yeah, it's a, it's a, and again, when you start thinking about doing blood resuscitation at high volume, you're not going to get any. You're going to get a liter an hour through the tibia. You're going to get six, seven, eight liters an hour through the proximal humerus or above. What about, so the skin fracture is just alcohol weight? That's it. It's a, not, it's a aseptic technique. I'm going to apologize now, but I say this to everybody. When you think about an emergent situation, everybody wants to do a central <clears throat> line. When you look statistically across this country at an emergently placed central line, there's anywhere from an 8 to 24% complication rate. An IO has a under 1% complication rate. All complications, under 1%. Right. You're not anywhere near the lung. You're not any... Exactly. So why can't we do that on there? Like, we should. Like, so the question would be, do you end up putting it in the central line? Absolutely, because the IO has its limitations. Right, right. How long it can dwell, the medicate. You can't put non-compatible medications through it. It lives by the rules of the peripheral line. But what it allows you to do is get somebody stable, get right. somebody resuscitated, or give them a couple liters of fluid. So when you go to do that central line, you can do it under the best circumstances right. to oh, minimize yeah. those risks yeah. and complications. And that's what you always, it's funny how often internal medicine people will argue that point that, oh, I've never had a complication with a central line. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah. good, good for you. But it is emergently versus a planned placement. Got it, awesome. Any questions? I know I went quick, but I know. No, yeah, yeah, I think also the questions I had is the length of time that we can keep it in. Yeah. Um, which one do you see more complications? We well, already kind of covered these are more with tibia. And you can definitely get more fluids through the oh. humorous one. I did not know that. Yeah. Cool. Worlds different. <laughs> once you go to it, once you use it once, and you have it, it, you just never go back. And it ends up being a very easy site because there's. The tibia you have about the size of a dime to hit the right spot. The proximal humerus you have a half dollar and you're going to be good to go. I guess I was more afraid of hitting the humerus than the tibia. The tibia seems a little bit easier. It's just because just it because it's further away. Yeah. <laughs> Here it's now it's also two centimeters above the yeah medial, medial malleolus. malleolus. Two centimeters above, find the borders of the bone and straighten. 
but let's remember, in 30 plus years, I have never used the distal tibia. In recent years, I came to learn that the distal tibia is, in actually the Achilles is a watershed area. So anything you push through here will never be well vaccinated. So you will never get an anticipated predictable effect from the max. It's one of the reasons we push people away. I mentioned the six liters and how quick it is from here. But one liter in the tibia. But we also know in a healthy adult, it's anywhere from 35, 35 to 45 seconds to get from the lower extremity to central circulation. So cardiac compromise, arrest, or even multi-system trauma, how long is it going to take to get up there in somebody who's in compromise? Probably three to four uh, times as long. Mm -hmm. When you look at that, when you look at epi or any pressor, they all have under a two-minute half-life. So if it's three minutes to get there in a two-minute half-life for the med, how much therapeutic value are you really getting out of it? Mm -hmm. Probably not much. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to... <clears throat> to avoid the tibia. The one thing that I would say, it's still a good site for somebody who's perfusing well that has a great blood pressure. So pulmonary edema, crash pulmonary edema, that's hypertensive tachycardic. Somebody status epilepticus, head injury, who's got Cushing's going on and they're hypertensive and tachycardic. It'll work well, especially if they're flailing about because one of the things you lose with the arm, so let's say you get that vascular access, you're giving fluid. If you end up midline, all you're gonna be able to do is move the arm about that far until you hit the acromion plate. If you go anterior, you'll get about that far in range of motion. So when you think about your next logical step to put in a chest tube, well, you wanna make sure that you can get that arm out of the way and gain access to the axillary area. That's the one limitation. Once you put it in there, that arm really has to kind of stay next to them. What kills these needles is, now somebody goes to draw blood, takes the arm, brings it out, drops it off the bed. Well, the needles hit the acromion plate and out it goes. Uh, you bring them to CT and the CT tech tries to put the arms over the head with an IO there. It will never survive that. I simply put a sling on them because it's not really serving an immobilization purpose, but what it does is trigger that next person down the line to look, see that it's slinged, and either avoid it or ask the question. So CTA, I mean, most of them are going to have their arms up, though, right? You're mentioning that. Well, no, they can do it with their arms down. They like to do them with their arms as well because it creates less yeah. scatter radiation right. and they can see better, but you don't have to have them. I mean, if they're unconscious and can't move, they're not going to. Yeah, I've seen people who follow commands, always arms right. up, but I've also seen a lot of people who aren't, strokes, stuff like that, yeah. where they're not even trying. They're just leaving the arms down and they'll do, but head, chest, neck, belly. So if you're placing uh, basically an IO on either arm, just kind of keep that arm, you know, non mobile Next to yeah. all the time that they have the yeah. IO in. Exactly. Right. Any other questions? So quickly to review, um, yellow for humerus. You got it. Blue for tibia. tibia. And pink for babies. babies. Yeah, pink, pink for no really one. should be for no one. Right. You guys don't have a, well, if you got called down to do something on a neonate, you could consider right. pink if they have no tissue. Just remember, fall back on the tissue not the weight range. Got it. And you said for a neonate, you don't want to go or like for a kid? So, do you want to go it's for a purely, there is no age or weight base to go to the proximal humerus. It all has to do with anatomical formation. If it, the two bones have not fused together yet to create that greater tubercle, you can't use it. So, I mean, I guess I need to review when that happens. You know? Yeah. So where do you typically go proximal? I'd go femur. Femur. Yeah. Indeed. I would go femur every time. I've used it twice so far and had very good success with the femur. And it's how far above? Two centimeters. Two centimeters. Oh, two centimeters. Sorry. One centimeter above, one to two oh, centimeters. And babies, one centimeter below. Yeah, one yeah. centimeter above, one to two medial. Okay. And you just feel that flat part of the bone. 
The only drawback to that is if the knee bends at all after you place it, if it articulates, straightens for that matter, it will knock the needle out. So you have to immobilize that leg. Okay. okay. Good times. Any other questions? Every time I say that, you come up with a new set of questions. <laughs> no, I, I think that I asked my question. All right. Everybody sign in? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you even put an email. Huh? Yeah. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul. I, I even got my it. holiday uh, masks <laughs> in just in time. <laughs>